Uh, if you have your Bibles, um, I want you to get ready. I'm going to wrestle and dance with a theme, theological theme and thread as opposed to um, one particular text. And so I want to, if you would oblige me for a moment, we've already read the scriptural context, which was Daniel chapter 3. But I want to strategically weave together a few different texts. And so, if you would, if you would go with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. It's going to be really quickly, really quickly. They should have it on the screens. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. And it reads, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as, as if as though it was something strange to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Then Isaiah 43 and 2, and I'm just going to read it. They'll put it on the screens. Isaiah 43 and 2, it reads, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. And then one more, Isaiah 61 and 3. Many of you know this one by heart. It says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion a crown of beauty instead of ashes. A crown of beauty instead of ashes. For the next few moments, I want you to dance with me around the subject, around the theme, rising from the ashes. Shout to your neighbor, I'm rising from the ashes. Look to somebody else and say, I'm fireproof. Now say it like you mean it, I'm fireproof. Rising from the ashes. Father, we pray. Lord, we pray. Lord, we pray. Lord, we pray. Uh, that you would open up our eyes so that we might see. Open up our ears so that we might hear. And Lord, touch our hearts. Open up our hearts so that we might believe what you're saying to us today. We Promise to give you the glory, the honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. We all said together. We all said together. Come on, shout, rising from the ashes. I want to um, start this dance, this, this hermeneutical dance, by reflecting on a man by the name of David Foster, who uh, in 1984 found himself sitting in a hotel room with tears flowing down his eyes. He, he found himself in a hotel room with tears rolling down his eyes. He was crying, wetting up his pillow as he wrote and composed one of the most profound love songs to ever hit the airwaves. You see, at that moment, he was trying to navigate one of the most challenging times of his life, one of the most challenging seasons of his life. His marriage was hanging on by a thread, and his sacred vows were being challenged at every turn. And this guy by the name of David, he wrote a song about a love that was being put to the test, about a love that had endured, about a love that was being pushed to the limit, about a love that was being tried. And, and when he finished that song, when he completed that song, when he had the song all together, uh, he turned to the queen of funk. He said, Shaka. He said, Shaka Khan, can you, can you come sing this song for me? Can you express uh, through, through voice? Can you express uh, through sound what, it, what, what my love is for my woman, what my love is for my wife? Can you, can you sing these words for me? And these were those words. He said, through the fire, to the limit, to the wall, for a chance to be with you. I gladly risk it all. Through whatever, through whatever come what may. For a chance. For a chance of loving you. All right. I take it all away. Right down to the what? Right down to the why. 
Even through the what? Even through the fire. Oh, y'all ain't been church of God all y'all life. Huh? Huh? Even through the fire. What? <laughs> what he found in that moment was that some of the greatest songs come out of our greatest pains. Some of our greatest life songs come out of our greatest life pains. He wrote these words to serve as a powerful reminder of what it means to love through tough seasons and what it means to love through tough challenging, challenging times and what it means to love through hard moments. He, he wrote these words to let his wife know that there is no limit to his love, that there's no wall that he won't climb, that there's not no wall that he won't destroy to keep him from being with the one he loves. He, he would give up absolutely everything. He would risk it all. He would go through the fire. Whatever came his way, he would go through it just to show his wife how much he loved her, how much he cared for her, how much he needed her, how much he wanted to be with her. And can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? Don't look left. Don't look right. Uh, in the words of P.J. Morton, how deep is your love? D does your love have limits? How far are you willing to go? How far are you willing to fight? What are you willing to push through and press through and get through uh, for the one that you say that you love? Is your love fireproof? Or is your love fickle? Is your, is your love fire tested or, or does your love falter at the first sign of heat? Uh, because I don't know about you, but I'm tired of getting in relationships and developing friendships and, and connecting with people who say I got you and say I'm with you only to find that they will leave you, only to find that they will forget you, only to find that they will ghost you at the first sign of trouble. Whew, but I am so glad I'm so glad that we serve a God who is not fickle like us. I am so glad that we serve a God who's not feeble like us. I'm, I'm so glad we serve a God who's not fake like us. I'm so glad that we serve a God who truly loves us. And he gave us 66 books full of love songs just to show us how much he loved us. Can I, can I show y'all how deep his love was? Can I, can I show you Isaiah 43? Uh, and he wrote a prophetic profession of his love through the prophet Isaiah uh, that said, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I am the Lord your God. I, I give you Egypt for your ransom. I give Cush and Seba in your stead. I give Cush for you and Seba for you since you are precious and honored in my sight. Why? I do this. Why? Because I love you. I, I, baby, I, I, I love you so much uh, that when you pass through the waters of life, I will be with you. When you, when you feel like you're drowning, I will be there to lift you up because I am the lifter of your head. When you walk through the fire, you will not be worried. Why? Why? Because I am the Lord your God. I'm the holy one. I'm the saving one. I'm the savior. And my love for you will cause me to do anything for you. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave everything. He gave everything. He gave everything so that you and I can feel how deep his love is for us. How much his heart yearns for us. How much his heart bleeds for us. How much he cares for us. But I'm afraid, beloved. I'm afraid uh, because we are living in a time where people don't understand that kind of love. <sighs> Sometimes I feel like this young generation has this idea in their heads uh, that love won't cost you nothing. That, that relationship won't cost you nothing. That, that relationship, that marriage won't cost you nothing. Love is going to cost you. If you've been married longer than five years, you know that love is going to cost you. If you've, been if you've been married for longer than five minutes, you know that love is going to cost you. If, you. if you've been married for any bit of time, you know that love is going to cost you some tears. Love is going to cost you some pride. Love is going to cost you some money.
Some of y'all still feeling the effects of bad love. Sometimes God's love for us, it is so deep, beloved, that he will let us go through the fire. Because he knows, here it is, that our miracle is in the flame. The flame, it cleanses us. The flame, it purifies us. The flame, it removes wrong people. The flame, it removes wrong places. The flame, it removes wrong things. It was the flame that fixed us. It was the flame that helped us. It was the flame that beautified us. Uh, but I, I have learned that many of us want the pretty without the price. That would preach by itself. Many of us, we want the pretty without the price. Do you know what it costs to look this good? Do, do you know what it costs to feel this good? Do, do you know what it costs me to live this good? This pretty has cost me something. I, I didn't wake up like this. I didn't hop out the bed like this. This costs me. I, I, I didn't wake up like, I didn't come out the womb like this. This costs me. Don't get it twisted, sister. You see me now, but I paid for this. Don't get it twisted, brother. You see me now, but I paid for this. I endured for this. I fought for this. I wrestled for this. I fought for that marriage. I fought for that career. I fought for that relationship. I fought for where I am right now. And don't y'all get bougie and deep with me because when Jesus found you deep in sin, it wasn't pretty. It was a process. You had to go through the fire to get your shine. You had to go through the flame to get beautified. It was a process to become like this. Uh, I know, I know, I know Drew Hill said beauty is her name. Uh, but don't start that lie. Busted was your name because you were jacked up from the floor. up. You, you, you were messed up from the toes up. But God, but God, but God, but God. But God fixed me, but God touched me, but God worked, he touched me and made me, I don't look like what I've been through. I don't look like what I feel, I don't, I don't feel like what I've been through. I don't smell like what I've been through, but God, but, but God, God doesn't put you through the fire for you to fail. He puts you in the fire to finish you. Being confident of this very thing that he that has begun a good work and you will come. Plead it. He will finish it. He will perfect it. He will finish what he started. And I may not be where I want to be. I may not be where I want to be right now. I may not be where I desire to be, but God. But thanks be to God that I'm not where I used to be. God is still working on me. God is still perfecting me. God is still finishing me. God is still moving in me. God's hand is still on me. There's, there's no question whether or not you are going to encounter fire. There's no question. There's no question. That's why I weaved in this first Peter text. Because first Peter, it says, it says, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come to you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Can y'all put the message version of that up? Can y'all, I want, I want to read the youth pastor version. Do they got it? Do they got it? Not yet, not yet. Well, this, this is how it goes. It says, friends, my friends, when life gets really difficult, so, so when the challenges come, when the fires of life come, don't come to the conclusion that God isn't on the job. Did did you think that because you were going through, God wasn't working on you? Did you think that because you were going through, God wasn't working for you? Did you think that because you were going through, God wasn't working in you? Friends, when life gets really difficult, don't jump to the conclusion that I'm not working. I'm working when you can't see it. I'm working when you don't know it. I'm working even in the midst of what it is that you're going through. Instead, be glad that you are in the very thick of what Christ has experienced. Why? James said, count it all joy when you find yourself in various trials. Why? Because this is a spiritual refining process with the glory just around the corner. Y'all don't know 
want to shout. Uh, this, this is a spiritual refining process with glory around the corner. The text is trying to teach us, beloved, that the fire in your life is just a sign that glory is around the corner. The text is trying to show us that the fire in your life is just a sign that glory is on the way. Your healing is on the way. Your deliverance is on the way. Your breakthrough is coming. Your, your, whatever it is that you need is around the corner. And some of us, when we're walking down the hall, when we're walking down the hall and we get to that corner, we need to check. Is glory here? When, when we're walking down the street and we get to the end of the block, you need to check. Is my glory around the corner? So how many of you are looking for your glory? What is keeping you from pressing? I've, I've gone through hell long enough. I've pressed through hell long enough. I know... I know it's hot in here, beloved. Lord, I'm hot. Uh, when you're going through hell, keep going. Don't stop. Don't quit. Don't give up. Why? Because glory is around the corner. Help is around the corner. What, what is around your corner if you keep pressing? What is around your corner if you keep pushing? What is around your corner if you refuse to be defeated? What is around your corner if you refuse to quit? The famed, the famed psychiatrist, Carl Gustav Jung, he said, the difference between a good life and a bad life is how well we walk through fire. The difference between a good life and a bad life is how well you walk through the fires of your life. How are you walking through your fires? How are you handling the heat in your life? Uh, how are you handling the fame in your life? I, I get it. I get it. I get it. Some of you were saying, PG, I hear you. That sounds great. Ah, glory's around the corner. Ah, that, 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 that sounds great. But what do I do in the meantime? What do I do when it's hot in here? What do I do when I'm running out of breath? What? What do I do when the flames are getting closer and closer? What do I do uh, when, when everything around me is burning? What do I do uh, in the meantime? Because all I see is ashes. All I see are the ashes of brokenness. All I see are the ashes of defeat. All I see are the ashes of grief. All I see are the ashes of failure. All I see are the ashes of divorce. All I see or the ashes of debt. All I see is ashes. So how do you expect me to expect glory is coming around the corner when all I see are the ashes in my life? I've been through the fire and I've lost some stuff. I've been through the flame and I've lost some people. I've been through the fire and I've suffered some setbacks and defeats. And I'm still here, but I'm hurting inside. I'm still here, but I'm inwardly grieving. I'm still here, Lord, but I'm inwardly crying. I'm, I'm still here, Lord, but I want to give up. I'm, I'm still here, but I'm trying my best not to lose faith in the midst of the fire, in the midst of the flame, in the midst of the heat. What do you do when the fires are raging in your life? What do you do when you find yourself facing wildfire after wildfire and flame after flame? How do I face the flame and not give in? How do I not focus on the ashes? Because the enemy, all he'll want me to see are the ashes. All he'll want me to see is what was lost. All he'll want me to see is what was burned as a result of the flame. Uh, but in the book of Daniel, we're introduced to three young exemplars and examples of what you do in the midst of the fire. We're introduced to three young men, three young boys by the name of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Y'all know them from Sunday school with Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro. You know, that's black church. He's a bad Negro. He's not a bad Negro. <laughs> but like you, these young men, they found themselves rising from the ashes. 
these young men had been, before we get to Daniel chapter 3, we meet them in Daniel chapter 1. These, been, these men have, they went through hell and back. Because in Daniel 1, the text says that they are literally on their way from the ashes of defeat. They, they, they are literally on their way from the ashes of failure and loss. Have you ever found yourself fighting in a battle and loss? I know it's church. I know we like to be deep. Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. I win all my battles. No. There are some battles that we lose. There are some battles that we fought for years and lost. There's some stuff that we're still fighting from 10 years ago. <sighs> Have you ever put everything you had into something and still suffered defeat? The text, the text tells us that King Babylon, King Nebi, has just conquered Jerusalem. He, he just conquered Jerusalem and he, he destroys their city. He ravages their temple. He takes everything out of the house of God. He captures their people. So now the people are in captivity. Scholars say it lasted 70 years. 70 years of captivity. And so he takes absolutely everything. He takes their homes. He takes their land. They lost their families. They lost their possessions. They, they have literally been separated from everything and everyone that they love. Can you imagine being separated from everything and everyone you love. Can you, can you imagine everything that you hold dear is gone within an instant? Can you imagine being separated from the home that you built and the land that you tilled? Can you imagine losing everything that you worked so hard for? Can you imagine losing your wife or losing your kids, losing your family, and now you want my faith? Do you, do you not know who I am, King Nebi? Now you want my name? Do, do you not know who I am? My name is Hananiah. My name is Hananiah, and it means Yahweh is gracious to me. My name is Azariah, and it means Yahweh has helped me. My name is Mishael, and it means who is what God is. In other words, there's no God like Jehovah. I, I know it's hot right now. I, I know, I know, I know, I know uh, we're going through hell right now. I know we're surrounded by nothing but ashes. But today I'm determined, number one, to rise up with promise. Somebody say rise up with promise. Why? Because promise, his promise is in my name. Y'all better stop naming your kids Jabubu and Moniqua and the Tay Tay. Name your kids names that got some power. Huh? These boys could say, I don't need to look around at my situation. I don't need to look at, look at what's going on around me to see what God is going to do. I, I don't need to look out at Babylon to, worry, to wonder about what God was going to do. Why? Because in my name, he tells me what he's going to do. Every time somebody calls my name, he's reminding me that his grace is sufficient for me. He's reminding me that his grace is with me. He's reminding me that his grace covers me and it's, it keeps me and it's on me. Every time somebody says my name, I know that grace is on me. <laughs> Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Come here, Azariah. My name is, my, my, my name is a promise. A promise that God will help me in my time of trouble. He will help me in my time of need. He will save me. He will deliver me. When I'm sinking, he will save me. When I'm falling, he will grab me. When I'm hurting, he will heal me. When I'm down, he will lift me up. My God, he will help me. And just in case, just in case you forgot uh, Azariah, just in case you forgot Hananiah, I sent a uh, I sent Mishael to let you know who is like the Lord. Nobody. Uh, there is, there's, there's none like you. And all the world, I searched the world and couldn't find nobody. I searched Babylon, I couldn't find nobody. I searched Israel, couldn't find nobody. I searched uh, China, I, I, I searched the world and I couldn't find nobody like you. There's none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I can search for all eternity, Lord. There is none 
like you. There's nobody like our God. And King Nebi, you may try to change our names, but you cannot change our nature. Because I am a son of the tribe of Judah. All I do is worship and all I do is praise. Did you not know that I came from the temple? You can take my land, but you cannot take my Lord. You can play all the horns you want. You can play all the bows you want. You can have them bow to whoever it is that you want. You can sing to whatever statue that you want. But my worship to God is a predicated upon where I'm at. My worship to God is predicated upon where he is. And the word tells us that no matter where we find ourselves in life, God is with me. Just because I'm in a foreign land does not mean I forgot who I am. Just because I'm in a foreign land does not mean I forgot whose I am. Just because I'm in a foreign land does not mean I forgot his promises to me. That is why not only do I rise with promise, number two, here it is, I rise up with power and purpose. What do I mean? What do I mean? The text says that after the king took everything that they had and couldn't break them, uh, after, after he took all their belongings, all their homes, all their money, all, all the stuff that they had, he tried to change their names and couldn't break them. And after he tried to change their names, he tried to change their faith and couldn't break them. Then he threatened them and said, if you do not bow and worship my statue, you will be thrown into the furnace. And then this is where he messed up. He had the nerve to say, what God will be able to save you then? This is where you messed up. This was the moment that Nebi messed up. Uh, because he just escalated the situation. Because now it just went from being solely about me, being solely about the Hebrew boys, to now being solely about their God. Now you have given me a reason to prove who my God is. You have given me a reason to prove that doubt is wrong. You have given me a reason to rise from my ashes. Y'all remember, y'all remember when you were kids and somebody tried to bully you and you would try to avoid the fight? You, you would try to stay away. You would, you would try to let it go. You know, they'd be talking about your clothes and talking about your sneakers, talking about your Jordans, and then they would say something about your mama. Oh, you say something about my mama and something comes over you. You say something about my mama and a strength comes in you. You say something about their mama and something comes in you. Now say something about their daddy. Oh, your daddy crusty. But if you say something about their mama, it's a wrap. And some of y'all had some mamas who would come down the street and fight with you. I feel like in my, in my youth past of mine, I see the Hebrews boys saying, I know you didn't just talk about my God. I know you didn't just challenge my God. I, I know you didn't just challenge my Lord. I, I know you didn't say what you thought. Who do you think you are? We don't have to answer to you. We don't have to listen to you. Do what you got to do. But just know if you do it, my God is going to show up. My God will deliver us. My God will set us free. My God will come and save us. My mama is coming. My Lord is coming. My Savior is coming. My King is coming. My deliverer is coming. Do what you got to do. And he will deliver us from you. But even if he doesn't, we're determined not to give you the victory. Because God will deliver me from death or he will deliver me in death. Either way, you won't get the victory. And this, and this is what the text says. Then Nebi was furious. He was, he was mad. He was real mad. He was big mad. And he was forced with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. And he ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. Hot, 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 hot. And commanded some of the strongest soldiers in the army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace so that these men wearing their robes, their trousers, their turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. Verse 22. The king's command was so urgent. And the furnace was so hot that the flames of fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men were firmly tied and fell into the blazing furnace. Now, I read that 
because I wanted to highlight something. In the Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox Church, they have a different variation of this Daniel text. When you look at the Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox Church, when you look at their Bible, in between verse 23, where they were thrown into the flame, and verse 24, uh, where they were delivered in the flame, there's a paragraph of text called the Prayer of Azariah and a Song of the Three Holy Children. And so it's in between these two verses that their text says that the moment that they hit the fire, the moment that they hit the flames, they walked around singing hymns to God and blessing the Lord. And then Azariah stood still in the fire and he prayed out loud. The moment they hit the fire, here it is, number three, they rose with prayer and praise. Uh, uh, that's, what caught, that's what caught the king's attention. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Something's not right here. What, what's going on? What's that noise? I turned the heat up so I didn't have to hear their mouth. I, I turned the heat up so that I can silence them. I turn the heat up so that I can shut them up. I turn the heat up so that I wouldn't have to hear from them. But instead of screaming in pain, they were shouting with praise. Instead of shouting for help, they were shouting hallelujah in the highest. When the devil turns up the heat in your life, turn your praise up. When the devil turns the heat up in your life, turn your thank you Jesus up. When the devil turns the heat up in your life, turn your dance up and just start shouting and just start dancing and say hallelujah. Thank you Jesus. Pray when the devil turns your heat up. Somebody says start shouting. <sighs> At the moment that they opened up their mouth, God met them right there in the furnace. Has God ever met you in the midst of your praise? Has, has God ever inter intervened in the midst of your worship? Have you ever found yourself in one of the most challenging seasons of your life and you learned to praise your way through it? Where my praise is at? Well, where are the remnants of Judah? Where are the remnants of worship? Where are the remnants of praises who say praise is what I do? Praise is what I do. Praise is what I do. Is there anybody who will let the devil know that I will bless the Lord at all times and his praises shall continually be in my mouth. I don't care what I'm going through. I don't care what I'm fighting. I don't care what I'm wrestling with, but I will praise the Lord. Bless you, brother. It's hot in here. The devil's trying to turn the heat up, but he's looking for some people in here to open up their mouth and shabak the Lord. Open up your mouth and praise the Lord. Open up your mouth and let the devil know that you can turn the heat up in my life. But what the moment that you do, I want to turn the praise up in my life. Woo! I will bless him. Now uh, is the time to shout because he inhabits the praises of his people. Oh, what does that mean? He inhabits the praises. He inhabits the praises. He inhabits the praises, which means when I praise God, he comes in the room. When I praise God, he occupies our space. When I praise God, he comes in the dwelling. When I praise God, he comes lives with me. When I praise God, he comes walks with me. When I praise God, he comes and talks with me. When I praise God, God enters the room. And I remember years ago, I remember years ago, years ago, my grandfather, he was driving. He was driving, and it was really bad weather. And as he's driving down the road, there was a car that was swerving to him. There was a car that was driving towards him. There was a car that was coming towards him. And the moment that the car made impact, he shouted, Jesus! 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 And the moment that that car hit his car, he didn't have a scratch. The moment that he shouted the name of Jesus, what the enemy meant for evil, God turned, what, what, the tried, what the enemy tried to kill him, the enemy tried to take him out, the enemy tried to take him from this earth, but the moment that he opened up his mouth and said, Jesus, something happened in that car, something happened in that road, and I want to know, is there anybody who will shout the name of Jesus? Woo! He knew that the only way that I'm going to make it through, the only way that I'm going to get this, get through this, the only way that I'm going to survive, if it's on God. Somebody shout, it's on God. 
I'm going to live through it if it's on God. You're, you're, you're only here today because if it had not been for the Lord who was on your side, if it had not been for the Lord who was in your marriage, if it had not been for the Lord who was there with your sickness, if it had not been for the Lord in that storm, if it had not been for the Lord in that trial, if it had not been for the Lord in that fire, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, if it had not been for the Lord being with me in school, if it had not been for the Lord being with me at work, if it had not been for the Lord being on my side, where would I be? If it had not been for him showing up, where would I be? There are some moments when all I had was my thank you, Jesus. All I had was my hallelujah. All I had was my praise the Lord. And, there, and it's in those moments where all you have is all you need. <laughs> All you have is all that you need. There were times when you, you felt like giving up, but God whispered in your ear that there's more to life than this. There were times when you felt like giving in, but God told you you have purpose. There were times when you felt like checking out, but God said, I told you about a plan that I had for you. If it had not been for God for us, if it had not been for God with us, if it had not been for God in us, where would we be? You can praise God in the midst of your fire because you know that my present circumstances are not my end. My, my present circumstances are not my END. So I can praise God in the midst of the furnace because I have peace in his presence. Lord, I've got more peas than I got time. Have you ever gotten into worship and peace came over you? When peace, like a river, attendeth my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. His words say, I will keep you in perfect peace. Peace will have you saying it is well when there's nothing but chaos around. Peace will have you saying I, I, I will get through this. I have peace not just, not just because I put it on the altar. I have peace not just because I've learned to praise my way through it. I have peace because I have his presence. I've got peace because time and time again he has shown me that he is with me. I've got peace because I know when God shows up. Somebody shout, when God shows up, when God shows up, when God shows up, he brings peace, he brings calm to my chaos, he brings healing to my hurts, he brings me beauty for my ashes. In other words, in other words, when he shows up, here's my last point, you can rise with pulchritude. Somebody say pulchritude. <laughs> it's a fancy word for saying beauty. When I... When I was dating my wife back before we got married, I used to say, baby, you're so pulchritudinous. <laughs> Trying to be all deep and corny. Baby, you are so pulchritudinous. But what is it? It means beauty. And why would I say that in regards to this text? Because this chapter ends in verse 30. The king, the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. And so... It shows us that I know you lost some stuff in the fire. I, I know some people are no longer with you. I know there are some things that you may be missing. But God's divine power is capable of transforming the most darkest moments of our lives into something beautiful. You had to go through the fire. Because it was the fire that perfected you. And now that you've been through the fire, now that I've completed the process, 
Now that I've burned all the other stuff away, now that you're fire tested, now that you're competed, let me show the world your shine. The story of the Hebrew boys reminds us that when everything seems lost, God can restore what we lost. He can bring abundance into our lives when we've lost everything. They had to, they had to endure the unimaginable physically, mentally, and emotionally. And yet, their unwavering faith led to a double portion of blessings. Because now, the people that were thrown into the furnace have been promoted in all the land. Which shows us this, that God, that our restoration is not limited to what we had before, but God can exceed our wildest expectations when we trust him in the fire. The journey, beloved, of rising from the ashes requires unwavering perseverance. Yes. 2 Corinthians 4, 8, 9 says, we are reminded that though we may face hardships, we are not crushed or abandoned. We, we may be struck down, but we're not going to be destroyed. With God's strength, we can endure and overcome any challenge that comes our way. I was, I was talking to Sister Brigitte the other day. She's over in her kids. And she said something that was so profound. I almost didn't want to give her credit. <laughs> she, said, she said, what kind of God gives you beauty for ashes? What, what kind of God gives you beauty for ashes? What kind of exchange is that? I said, ooh, that's good. Try taking your wallet with some ashes in it and see what you get. <laughs> what kind of God gives you beauty for ashes? The text says, and I will give you a crown of beauty instead of ashes. I will give you joy instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Can I share something with you? that I didn't mention before. The text says that when they were thrown in the fire, they had their turbans on, their robes on. These are festal garments. Festal garments are celebratory garments. Clothes that you would wear to a celebration. So, what should be gasoline in a fire turned out to be garments of praise for their promotion. They had no idea that the outfit that they had on was preparing them for their promotion. And so when the devil turned the heat up on them, when the devil had them go through the fire, which should have served as gasoline, is now garments of praise. Oh, I wish, I wish, I wish I had a church who, who understood what I'm saying right now. The, the, these boys, they went through the fire and came out with no burns. They came out with no signs of being through the flame. They came out not with ashes, but with a promotion. What? What is keeping you from getting the very thing that God has for you? Are you allowing the heat? Are you allowing the flame? 
Are you allowing the fire? Are you allowing the challenges that you find yourself in cause you to give up when your glory is around the corner? The text says when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. When you walk through the fire, the flame won't get you. When you find yourself tested, you're going to be tested, beloved. But this word is to serve as a reminder that even though you're going to be tested, even though you're going to feel the heat, even though the flames will be surrounding you, Rising from the ashes of defeat. Rising from the ashes of failure. Rising from the ashes of despair. Rising from the ashes of hurt. Rising from the ashes of grief. Rising from the ashes of every battle that I lost. I am determined not to lay in my ashes, but to get up from my ashes.